morning, everyone. Um, my name is Craig Whitford, and I'm the volunteer uh, coordinator for the Meteorite Collection at Abrams Planetarium on the campus of Michigan State University. I think this might be our seventh um, Facebook Live installment um, from They Came From Earth. And uh, in this, uh, we've shared with you a little bit of history about meteorites, how to identify meteorites, um, the different types of meteorites, uh, just uh, in handling uh, space rocks. Uh, we've been able to visit uh, asteroids from the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, um, Mars, the moon, the asteroid Vesta. I mean, just to think, uh, from our own desktop, we've been able to go several places in our universe. And uh, uh, just a word before we really do get started is today's a historic day for NASA, uh, for SpaceX, in launching uh, two astronauts uh, from the United States for the first time since the shuttle missions ended. Uh, 10 or 11 years ago. So it's quite a historic time. Uh, be sure to uh, share the event uh, with your children, um, with your grandchildren. Uh, it's, uh, I think most newscasts are set to get started around 4, 420. The launch is scheduled for 433 today. Uh, so uh, uh, a lot of firsts are happening today uh, with this launch. And uh, I don't think it's one you're you're going to want to miss. So uh, I have a look at that, and I'm sure we'll have something on the Abrams Planetarium uh, Facebook page for you to take a look at. So um, today's event that we're going to share with you is uh, a little bit different. Um, something close to my heart. It's what got me started in all of this, and uh, that is as a hobby. Uh, in collecting uh, space rocks. And uh, so I thought I'd review with you some of the, the things you can uh, look for if you decide to create your own collection and how to create a collection, uh, which ways do you want to go. And um, what I most generally a collection starts with somebody giving you uh, uh, your first space rock. Um, who knows what it might be. It could be just like this ordinary chondrite uh, piece of rock from outer space. This one is oriented, so it came through the atmosphere nice and perfect. And uh, shows the melt on the back, shows where it, it fragmented even, the rough areas there. And then um, that unmistakable uh, shield or dome type shape that's there. Um, that just brought it right into the surface of the earth. So, and, um, so you might only have a single space rock, but boy, there's a lot you can do with it. There's, uh, so many studies out there, whether it's an iron or a stone or a palisite or a moon rock, uh, whatever it may be, uh, you can always hop online and, and, uh, learn about it. Um, the one caveat with that is is that just remember not everything you read or hear on the internet is true uh, from that standpoint so it is always a good idea um, to check out some books and uh, this one is the art of collecting meteorites and you can see the author there um, he has uh, traveled all over collecting meteorites, hunting meteorites, and that, uh, creating price guides for meteorites. And uh, this book he published a few years ago. Uh, I believe it's available on the probably a books or the secondary market. Uh, you could try Amazon, The Art of Collecting Meteorites, and it'll take you through a lot with some great stories included, as always. And as you can see, it's a pretty good-sized book. It's... Uh, Oh, 220 some odd pages. So with a with an index and everything. 
Uh, another book uh, that's an easy easy one to get into is What's So Mysterious About Meteorite by Richard and Dorothy Norton there. And this is produced by Mountain Press. Um, see that? This one is 92 pages, but it is absolutely filled with all kinds of information. Um, another one to check out. Uh, a couple I shared with you at the beginning. Um, Rocks from Space by Richard Norton. This is the second edition. Again, you have to go to the secondary market to find it. But very inexpensive book uh, and a great book to get you started about learning about meteorites. Uh, hold on just a second. There we go. Um, a brief book by National Geographic Kids is on meteors, and this is brief, but it answers a lot of questions, a lot of photos, uh, things like that, and very inexpensive. Uh, and then a book that uh, we also talked about early on and had a segment on was On the Trail of Stardust by John Larson. Uh, John's got a new book that's just coming out, should be available anytime. And this is one about finding meteorites in your own backyard. And this could be off your roofs, your downspouts, your gutters, everything. And he gives you a virtual step-by-step -step walk through finding these very micrometeorites. I know my granddaughter, uh, who lives in Mississippi, is uh, giving this a try. So... Um, and I'm giving this a try as well for our new exhibit at Abrams Planetarium. And uh, we'll have much more on this uh, coming in the future from the planetarium. Uh, maybe even some outdoor activities. Wouldn't that be fun? Huh? Get us all out of the house again? Whoa, that'd be great. So, so those are some books um, that might light your fire into a new collection. Um, or just starting a collection and doing that. And I'll tell you what, as you've seen on this program, that it's not so much the size of the meteorite that counts, okay? This would be called a micro, and a lot of people collect just micros of falls and finds and things like that. And this one comes with its own specimen card right out of France right there it's Dravel. Uh, this one hit a clay tiled roof in France and so I even have pieces of the roof tile that go along with this but most generally um, any respectable dealer uh, that's uh, in the business or collector will have their own specimen cards it'll give you the name of the the uh, meteorite which is usually the the town and or location in which it fell, uh, the country in which it fell, the day it fell, sometimes the time, um, how it's classified. This one, as you can see, is an H chondrite right there. And it will also include the total weight of the fall so that you can see from this tiny little speck came from seven and a half kilograms, so 15 pounds of a meteorite. And um, I know a lot of people that collect micros, so they're inexpensive from that standpoint because even a tiny piece like this on a rare meteorite can cost you uh, several hundred dollars. But the lesser, more common types, Northwest Africa, recent falls, things like that, uh, may not cost you as much. Uh, because of their price. And uh, so collecting micros is one way to go. Um, another way to go is by collecting uh, slices. And this one's a little difficult to see. Let me take it out of its holder. And we'll talk a little bit about holders too. There we go. And you can probably see this one a little bit better. Oh, there we go. 
and look at all of the different inclusions. That's what I love is just uh, all the different inclusions that you can find within a meteorite that came from a larger asteroid body that smashed apart in space and then reformed into another stony body. And you can just see that. You can see the um, sparkles that are in it, which are the iron nickel flecks that are there. Um, and you could see all the chondrules that, all the space dust that went in to make up whatever this rock was here that joined um, this body. And um, this is a case. Cases come in all sizes. Um, and that way you can safely store your meteorite. This one actually has a membrane in it so that it holds it secure while being uh, transparent. And then it uh, locks at the top. Uh, cases like this are a little pricey, but uh, you can always uh, look at cases like this, which have a foam top that you could see there. Uh, that the meteorite rests in. Uh, a lot of my meteorites are in these. Or another uh, clear membrane case would be something like this. You could see that membrane right there that uh, that just flexes uh, with the meteorite and the paper's just in there to separate the two membranes. And then it closes down and, and kind of uh, fits with a with a lock snap right there. Um, sometimes uh, meteorites could just be in a baggie if you don't have a case uh, for it. And then what I would do is mark on there all the information that you need uh, from that standpoint. Uh, Ziploc baggies, if you're out doing field work, uh, also work well. Uh, some people in the community, collectors and dealers alike, have produced the little cases like this. This is a sample of one of ours from the gift shop. As you can see, our logos on it. Uh, history about the meteorite. A uh, little bit of everything. Gives you a nice color image there so that it's not just a stone sitting inside the case uh, that's cut out and uh, uh, identifies uh, the meteorite. So uh, they'll stay in these pretty much forever. Um, a word of caution about taking care of meteorites. Uh, stony meteorites, not so much, unless you're getting water on them and things like that. Uh, they most generally don't oxidize while they're in your collection, um, but there's moisture in the air, and so we use it as a desiccant, uh, that uh, material that helps dry out that moisture from being in the air. Um, iron Meteorites and palisite meteorites uh, for a climate like Michigan are problematic unless you've got atmospheric controlled conditions or um, you're able to, to keep uh, fresh desiccant on. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's hard to keep up with, uh, with uh, fresh desiccant so that uh, everything stays nice and dry. And uh, those are some of the things that you learn along the way. Uh, from that standpoint. A um, couple of other tools that uh, come in handy are a magnifying glass, okay, of any type, any strength, so that you can look at your meteorite. Um, if you're out collecting samples, if you live uh, near deserts and things like that where you can uh, look for meteorites or if a fall occurs and you happen to be within fairly good proximity, I would say a few hours of where the fall occurred and travel to it. Um, you may want to have a, a digital scale with you um, so that you can weigh the specimens and uh, collect the data. Uh, you'd want to collect GPS, things like that. Uh, don't touch the meteorite uh, right away. Um, have some baggies with you with a Sharpie so that you can record the GPS, the weight and everything, the time you found it, uh, things like that. Take photographs of everything as you go. Uh, most generally try to collect fresh meteorites 
uh, in the aluminum foil so that you don't touch them. You can use tongs. Um, another handy thing to have is a pair of cotton gloves right here. And I do handle some of my med meteorites and also the meteorites from the planetarium with cotton gloves so that the oils from my uh, fingers aren't transferred uh, directly to the stone and um, impair its condition in any way. Uh, the school's really out on whether you wear gloves or whether you don't wear gloves. It's a rock, right? But it's an extraterrestrial rock. And being fresh, if you see it fall, uh, you want to preserve whatever you can for science because uh, that's why we're here. We're here to learn more and more about our solar system. And uh, it's best to have uh, fresh materials because I'll share with you one that that just recently fell. And um, um, on the day it fell, um, a lot of the material was picked up uh, by people in the area. But a day later, it rained. And so any rocks... Um, that were out there during the rains have already started to oxidize and have terrestrial elements uh, uh, attached or in their fractures and things like that. Because uh, even in the Sahara with a fresh fall, as the sands blow, it tends to fill those cracks and start to break them open. And any moisture at all will start to have an impact on the uh, material inside. Um, another thing we can talk about here is um, this is a small piece of the meteorite that uh, damaged the mailbox in Claxton, Georgia in 1984 on December 10th. It's a special meteorite for me, my birthday meteorite. Um, no, I wasn't born in 1984, but it is December 10th. And uh, this is a fragment, but... Um, uh, the dealer who sold it uh, even included a certificate of authenticity that you see here, giving all the information and signed it. Um, not much different from the specimen ID card that you might get with some meteorites like this, which is what I like and like to give out. Um, gives all the information that's pertinent to it. Um, and the biggest thing here is like any certificate of authenticity or ID card, um, it's only as good as the dealer selling it or the collector offering it or selling it or whatever it may be. Um, it's always important to look uh, for dealers and some collectors that uh, belong to national organizations and things like that, um, that, you know, certainly back up their claim, can use peer pressure, you name it, uh, to do it. But uh, these are all important attributes of this um, right here. So, um, and talking about Claxton, uh, one area you can collect are uh, meteorites that have hit something. Um, and these are called hammer stones. It could be a roof, it could be a car, it could be a mailbox like this one here, uh, it could be a fence post, it could be anything, but all at once they become hammer stones. And there's a whole host of collectors out there that collect hammer stones. So uh, keep that in mind. That's uh, one collecting area that uh, you can look for. They tend to be a little bit more expensive uh, in some cases in that. But i uh, share another one with you. This is uh, New Orleans from 2003. I believe this one hit a car. Um, so that's just a little fragment of that uh, with a label on it so that you know what it is from that standpoint. Um, usually, let's see, I'm just looking for a couple of things here. Um, sometimes when you have a major event, a meteorite impact uh, in the United States or around the world, uh, there are dealers out there that will create these little boxes. And that way they include items that were damaged by the meteorite. 
Um, could be roofing materials. It could be, uh, this is part of a blinds here. Um, a piece of wood uh, that came through. This little piece here is uh, the me a fragment of the meteorite. This is a photograph that shows all the drywall that was damaged in the house that you could see in the blinds and that. And um, on the back, uh, they've well identified what each of the pieces is and where they came from. And they have numbered this one as kind of a limited edition type thing. Uh, and this came from the stone that hit the Garza residence uh, in Chicago. So in the Chicago area. So kind of a neat little thing. Uh, easy to display uh, and things like that. Um, a unique area of collecting. There aren't too many meteorites available from it. But um, are those meteorites that are found in Antarctica? Right there. And this is an ordinary chondrite, as you can see there. Uh, this one was found in uh, 1976 on Alan Hills. And so it has the ALH uh, prefix, uh, the year it was found, 76. And this was the third meteorite found during that season. And that's how they number those. And uh, this is a slice. You could see the oxidation that has taken place. Antarctica is a pretty dry climate. But uh, these made their way onto the market in the early years because uh, um, exploring Antarctica for meteorites, I believe, started around 1975 or so. And so this is among the first. Uh, you were able to publicly own these at the time. And uh, a little talk about ownership, I guess, is if you're out on somebody's property and there's been a meteorite fall or something, you're going to want to get permission to hunt their property, uh, to actually go out on it and search for space rocks. Um, you're going to want to make an agreement with them, perhaps that either anything you find you get to completely keep or perhaps share on a 50-50 basis with the owner. And most generally, um, things like that, when you share with the owner, either the, on the value or the number of stones you found or something like that, um, it's uh, the owner's more apt to let you go out on their property. Now, if he's got 80 people out on his property, it becomes a little bit more difficult. But uh, let's say you're out in the Nevada desert or something like that, and um, or let's say you're in Chile and you're out on the Chilean desert. Um, be mindful of the, the rocks you find and everything and check for any laws. Uh, some countries have completely banned the export of meteorites. Any meteorites you find uh, belong to the government. Uh, you may, on others, have to get export permits, which take additional time and may take months uh, for you to actually get your meteorites by mail. Um, so be sure to check with any of the laws. Um, the Department of Land Management also has uh, restrictions. Uh, uh, dealers basically can't sell any meteorites that they may find on the property. And it looks like I dropped out here. Um, let's see, are we here? Trying, uh, if you can hear me, I'm still here. We may have to um, stop this and start another one. Let's give that a try. I'm going to end this video right now and uh, start it back up. Hold on.